into helping along human interactions into a more compassionate. Well, I think they started that several yeah, hundred years ago. That was the whole point of the Enlightenment. Yes. So but I, wouldn't I, your own research, Scott, uh, on the psychology of terrorists, how to build a terrorist, yes. wouldn't that be applying science to understanding something that ultimately has political implications? Yes, of course. But I'm just questioning the fact whether science should get involved in the in the processes of political um, motivations and happenings. Okay, can I just address that briefly? Yeah. Um, I had the, the honor of giving a tour of our new facility in New York, it was new six years ago, to um, Richard Holbrook, who was the, uh, shortly had finished his tour of duty as American ambassador to the United Nations. And he was a neighbor, so we, we did this for him. And I'm giving him, I'm showing the moon and the planets and the stars and, you know, and he starts asking questions. And he says, well, is, uh, how much more is the effect of the moon being closer now that I just learned that it's an elliptical orbit on the tides? I said, oh, good point. There's a strong distance dependence on tide. And we, go, we start going around. And the stars, the summer red, it must be a temperature thing going on there. Yeah, summer cooler. And he starts asking these questions. And I'm saying, well, this guy just, just came out of the Balkans in, in conversations with the unrest over there. And he's asking me informed questions about the cosmos. And so I said to him, where does this come from? This is not just, where did this come from? And he said, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. Actually, in college, I majored in physics. <laughs> Okay, and he switched his major like the last year or something. But he had his, this inculcation in sort of rational scientific thought that goes on in any physics curriculum. And I said, well, how, then I asked your question. And I said, has this worked in any one way or another, positively or negatively, in your negotiations, in your peace talks? And he said, I cannot imagine having accomplished what I did without that kind of thinking. Because, of course, in physics, you distill a problem to the, 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 its essence, find out that you shed what you don't need, look at what matters, and you discuss what matters. And when other people come in with their baggage, he cuts right through it and is able to, able to reach consensus in ways that others can't or can't even imagine. And so getting back to Steve's point, it's not so much that a law of physics gets invoked to solve an international problem, but certainly the training that goes on in the, in the mind of a scientist has got to be useful in solving problems, even interpersonal problems, more useful than not having that kind of background, well, uh, as, as evidenced by at least this one uh, I agree with what case. you said, except for the last thing, interpersonal problems. I, I, uh, no, and not in a facetious way, either. Uh, um, you know, I agree with you completely. I, I think what we should really need to teach is process of science, is how, and, and that's what we try and do, and you know, certainly as I'm as chair of the physics department, that's what we try and do. But, but I'm a little worried about this notion that people are intrinsically rational. I don't think people are, are, are intrinsically rational. I mean, you, there's a rational component to humans, but I think we depend on, our, most of us, on our irrationality to get through every day. Uh, it, and maybe, you know, to be happy, you have to be delusional. I don't know. Maybe it will, science will discover that. If we discover that in order to be happy, you have to be delusional at some point in your life, are we going to say you shouldn't be delusional? I don't know. I, I think that the notion that, that rationality is... Um, is is the central and major part of hum, human life is, is is not at all clear when I look around Nobody the world. Said it's an important. That. We're just we, it's, it's our it's job essential to, try to solving a debate. It's it's well it's it's very useful and I think it's essential. I, I think it's an essential component and it's our job to encourage it. But but uh, but I think we are fooling ourselves to think that that um, we'll ever live in a world that's completely rational. Yeah, I'm not saying that. I think there's. I think I, we should address this point because. Uh, there's a yawning chasm of uh, uh, nihilism waiting us if we don't uh, 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 seal it up. It, the the idea that there's this opposition <laughs> to, to, to speak rationally. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Why are we here? Chasm of yeah. nihilism. There's a, there are many many uh, justifications for uh, madness have been uh, uh, coming out of that hole. The this opposition between reason and everything else, I think, is fundamentally spurious. I think this, this idea that there's love on the one hand and then the cool rationality of science that's just all clatter and clockwork and soulless, this, this is a false dichotomy. And it's a, it's a dichotomy that is pervasive mm -hmm. in the culture. I, you know, you can't you know, I can't tell you how many times I get on the, on the radio and someone says, scientifically prove to me that you love your wife. Mm -hmm as though that were just a knockdown argument of all time against, you know, against reason and in support of faith. Um, 
there's nothing irrational in principle about love. I mean, it, it is rational to value love. It is rational to try to, ma to, to recognize that it is one of our uh, uh, most cherished experiences and, and then to try to, to, to live a life that maximizes it. Understanding love at the level of the brain is not going to deflate its, its importance for us. I mean, the fact that we, we can understand the molecular constituents of chocolate doesn't make us not want to eat chocolate. I mean, these are different scales of, of interaction with the world. And um, so it's not a matter of only being coldly calculating in, in our approach to life. But uh, where we have to call a spade a spade is in gratuitous claims to certainty about invisible realities and the moral structure to the, to the universe, about a God who so hates homosexuality that he will whip up tsunamis uh, in defense of, of chaste heterosexual people. I mean, this is, this is a, a, a vision of life that is animating millions and millions of our neighbors, and we have been cowed into not criticizing it. And I mean, to pick up what Pat Churchland said, this job is not best done by scientists. This is the, we need from from a hundred sides, culture at large, to to just make it fundamentally embarrassing to hold these kinds of certainties. And I don't know if you you know about how the, the KKK how its stature got so eroded in this in this country. But there's this this great little story about uh, this guy Stetson Kennedy who leaked he he joined the KKK and then he leaked all their goofy lingo and secret passwords to the people who were writing the Adventures of Su Superman radio series back in the 40s. And so every week, uh, it was Superman fighting the KKK with all the up-to-the-minute passwords and handshakes and, you know, bogus, cultish nonsense. And uh, so the, these, these grand wizards would come home and they would see their kids playing the K you know, KKK versus Superman on the front lawn with Superman winning and all these, <laughs> the current passwords. And they found this so humiliating, and this was so corrosive. And, and Stetson Kennedy was still, you know, inside the Klan. He would he would see the the aftermath of these effects at meetings. Um, and you know, the, I'm sure there were other other variables uh, involved. But the KKK is a, is functionally a, a, a defunct organization, whereas it had 20 million members, among whom were senators and even one president. Um, it's possible to make progress. Uh, and, we, and I think we just have to keep that in view. So uh, at this point, since we're coming up to lunch and Steve has to leave afterwards, um, I'd like to go from the yawning chasm of nihilism of Sam uh -huh. Harris <laughs> to the cosmological corner. You don't say that a second time. Like, you know, so once was enough say that for a second ears. Time, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so I'm the guy who gets to keep you from your lunch. Um, I have, uh, it's even worse than that uh, because uh, I have to leave. Uh, right away. I have to be in Austin uh, tomorrow morning, and so uh, after I finish saying what I'm going to say, I'm, I'm going to disappear going the back door. <laughs> in a puff of smoke. Um, That's a great opportunity. Then. But I, I think uh, I'm glad to have a chance to address this uh, without any hope of answering the question, because I think it's such a, an important question. If not religion, what? Um, Certainly, uh, I'm not one of those who would rhapsodically say, oh, science, you know, that's all we need to do is understand the world and uh, look at pictures of the Eagle Nebula, and uh, we'll, it'll, it'll fill us with such joy, we'll, we won't miss religion. Uh, I, I, think, I think we will miss it. Uh, I, I see religion somewhat as a, a crazy old aunt, that, um, you know, she, she tells lies and she stirs up all sorts of mischief and uh, she's getting on and she may not have that much li life left in her. Uh, but, you know, she was beautiful once and when she's gone, w we may miss her. Um, she's been with us for a long time. Uh, the desire for myths and... Uh, but still, you know, she does a lot of harm, and it's good that she's going. Uh, uh, the desire for, for myths and uh, for consolation, uh, Sam spoke of that very movingly, uh, having to console people for the deaths of their loved ones. Um, it's something science can't provide, the sense of magic about the world. Um, also, 